Hey, this is Chris Rowley from CD Baby, and you're about to hear the brilliant Simon Tam talk about how to get more creative and focused in the ways you introduce yourself to new audiences, build up a fan base, and, and how you keep them engaged. I just want to let you know about halfway through this, there's going to be about 10 or 15 seconds of some really strange, annoying digital crunchiness. Uh, stick through it. What he's saying is still audible there, and it's also really important for what follows in the discussion. So about the time you're starting to get really annoyed, it's going to end. So again, stick through it. And without further ado, here is Simon Tam from CD Baby's DIY Musician Conference 2019 in Austin, Texas. All right. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good convention so far. So my name is Simon Tam. I'm the host of a daily music business podcast show called Music Business Hacks. I also perform in a band called The Slants and do kind of a variety of other things. But today, uh, this is one of two sessions I'm doing while here at, in Austin. This one is specifically on how to dominate niche markets or target audiences. And tomorrow I'm going to be doing a session on social media. But before we dive in, I want to let you know about a contest. And that's where you have an opportunity to win a copy of every one of my books. Plus, in exchange, I'll also buy every single release you've ever put out as a musician. All you got to do is tweet at me and use the hashtag for the, the convention. I'm going to pick a couple random winners. And you can get some stuff and sell some music. Because really, that's what we're here for. I, I'm very, very passionate about supporting uh, fellow musicians. Uh, this is pretty much all I do. So um, follow along. If you have a favorite quote, something you really like, something you found useful, let me know. If there's something that you want to know more about, you can also tag me and let me know. So as we're kind of starting this conversation, I'm wondering if we can get a couple of people to participate here. I'm wondering, like, why would you want to focus on a niche market as opposed to like a big, broad market? Yeah. I play uh, Celtic. You play Celtic music, niche market. Yeah. So, so what's the benefit of focusing on like a smaller market? Um, you, uh, you can focus on different types of, of events. Uh, so, different venues. Yeah, focusing is, is really important. So I like to make this analogy that if you're trying to hit a large target, something that's, or a target that's far away, like a music business goal, it's a lot easier to hit a target that's far away with a laser than with a shotgun. Like, you want precision and focus. What about you? Yeah. <laughs> um, just like the specificity just helps you like, kind of like know what your strengths are as an artist and who your target market is that can really like, be supported by what you can do. Okay, so yeah, focusing in on those who are most eager to support you. That specific niche market allows you to develop a, perhaps more of a depth in terms of relationship as opposed to breadth, right? It's better results on Facebook ads, definitely. It's a lot better than trying to target everybody on the planet. You can make exactly what they want. You can make exactly what they want. And I love that. So if people who really practice in this area of niche marketing say, you don't try and find customers for your product. You try and find products for your customers. If you really try and understand an audience and find things that resonate with them, then that's when you will really kind of start seeing that, that payoff. So despite there being many, many advantages on focusing on niche markets, we find that most artists do the complete opposite. They think, well, I want to focus on the biggest audience possible. I want to focus on, on the most number of people. And we think about this all the time. Like, I'm going to play this major music festival because there's going to be a ton of people there. Or I'm going to play, I want to play this venue and open for this band because there's a lot of people there. Or I want to go on this social media channel because there's a lot of people there. Instead of saying things like, are they the right people that are there? Are they the right audience that's there? And so this is the kind of mindset that we have to train ourselves to break. It's, it's a lot easier to follow convention. In fact, there, convention is so embedded into the things that we do, like we actually have to actively train ourselves out of it. This is kind of a f funny fact about sumo wrestling, is that there is this move that essentially the rules are the same for every match. You have to push each other out of the ring. But if you think about it, if you are a smaller, lighter sumo wrestler, and you have somebody who's weighing four to 500 pounds running with all of their energy at you in this tiny ring, 
there's this move that's totally legal. You can just step to the side and let them run themselves right out of the ring. And you know what? It works every single time, but it's frowned upon. People think it's playing dirty, even though it's along with the rules. And, and so people fall into this tradition, and instead of winning, they kind of engage and they kind of run at each other like two trucks hitting each other. I feel like there are a lot of music business strategies that are like this, that we feel like, we, hey, if I just did this thing, if I just step aside and focus on my strengths and my advantages, maybe I can actually win here. But what ends up happening is we follow convention. We start copying the strategies that we, that we employ in our music business by just focusing on what other artists are doing. We go to panels, we go to sessions, we're like, what are those people doing? And then we try and follow along without thinking about that why question, or is it the right fit for my audience? And so I really want to encourage you to think like smaller is bigger. It is easier to be that big fish in a little pond than to be a medium-sized fish in a huge pond. And yet we find ourselves all the time hearing about an artist that will move to LA because of connections, or move to Nashville, or Portland, or New York, or any of these other kind of major cities, thinking that they're gonna make those relationships and not realizing that they have a, actually more of a chance to get lost unless they're actually connecting with their true audience. Smaller is also better in a lot of other ways. It allows you to be more nimble and avoid some of the pitfalls and expenses of trying to market to a major, major audience. So today, if, there's, if nothing else, I want you to remember this phrase, smallest viable audience, or SVA. The smallest viable audience is the minimum number of people that you need in order to be successful. Those of you who are familiar with Kevin Kelly knows of this kind of idea he projects called the thousand fans theory, that if you can get a thousand true fans, that's enough. You don't need a million, you don't need 10,000 fans, you need 1,000 true fans. And he defines a true fan as someone who's willing to spend 100 bucks a year on you. It's the kind of fan that will drive across town to go to your show. If you get a thousand of them and they spend 100 bucks on you, that's $100,000 a year. That's a pretty decent career. And of course, there's not actually a magic number out there, but no, understanding this mindset that if you can find a way to surprise and delight those thousand people while ignoring everybody else on the planet, you can actually have a career that is thriving and that, that is quite successful. Think about the companies, like every major company in this world, they all actually started out with small audiences. Who here has heard of TED Talks? Like pretty much everybody, right? But for most of its existence, they didn't market themselves. They didn't make themselves available to anybody. They were just these extremely expensive conferences available for those people who could afford the $8,000 registration fee to go there. They didn't even have any of these videos online, but people kept talking about it and talking about it, and it became this kind of the biggest secret available that it just spilled over so that when Ted released some of these videos, it just exploded in popularity. I mean, think about it. Anyone can upload videos, and especially videos of people doing 15 to 20 minute talks or less, but why is Ted successful whereas everyone else is just trying to catch up? It's because they found their core audience, people who fo are focused entirely on technology, entertainment, and design, and those people who get really, really excited, they naturally take that same energy and it spreads. Same thing with Facebook. I mean, nearly everybody on the planet who uses social media is on Facebook, yet Facebook started out at one place, at Harvard. If you wanted to be on Facebook, you could only get on Facebook if you were a student at Harvard. And think about it, it's actually kind of a brilliant strategy. Instead of trying to launch and hit, say, even just higher education, like, you know what, we're gonna get every single university in, this co in, the, in the country, instead of launching there, we're just gonna focus on this one university and say, you know what, people are gonna be talking about their friends, they're gonna be uploading pictures of you on this website, but you can only get in if you're on Harvard. And eventually, when they expanded to a couple other universities, everyone wanted to be on there because they, they, they had this fear of missing out. Like, wait, people are talking about me? I want to be on there so I know what they're saying. And of course, word spread, 
and Facebook eventually became this behemoth of what it was. But it all began with servicing and really modifying and tweaking a product specifically for one small audience. Think about this logo here. Does anyone know this band? Grateful Dead, that's right. So when you talk about like artists that feel like they need a hit to be successful, the Grateful Dead did pretty much everything opposite of that, okay? They didn't say like, you know what, let's make our songs three and a half minutes long because that's radio friendly. They decided like, let's ignore radio altogether. We're gonna encourage our fans to tape every single one of our concerts and release it on their own. They actually have thousands and thousands of live al albums out there because they're like, we don't care about the perfect studio polished album. We just want our music out there for our like hippie friends. Instead of going for those short pop hits, they went for long, long jams. And guess what? It worked out pretty well for them. They earned over $350 million in concerts in, the, in their career. They earned over $100 million even after Jerry Garcia died. And they continued to ignore radio. They only actually had one hit ever in their entire career. Yet they somehow managed to have a pretty impressive career. <laughs> so when we talk about finding the right audience, the smallest viable audi like audience, you want to talk about that right size. There are conventions out there specifically for soap makers. There are conventions out there for people who brew cider. And there are conventions out there for people who like to dress up like pirates, pretend that they're stuck in a Victorian era where everything's powered by steam, and those people thrive. I've been to several of those conventions, by the way. I perform at them. Like, if there's a convention for it, there's probably enough of an audience to give you a viable career, a smallest viable audience. So start thinking, like, what are those things that turn other people off or make their heads turn as people are walking to this kind of event or attending this kind of event? That's the idea. You don't want to try and, like, include people in, in this sense. You want to try and exclude them by focusing entirely on this niche audience when it comes to trying to dominate it. So, in other words, you want to make some heads tilt, some heads turn whenever you talk about the kinds of things that you do. That's how you get on the radar of people because people don't want to like something. They want to love it. Like, you want to find followers who are passionate about you because you understand them, not because you just happen to be one of many, many artists that they hit on Spotify or that they have on a playlist or they watch on YouTube from time to time. You want the kind of person that like, can't wait for your next release. And the way you do that is by really understanding and serving your audience. So earlier you mentioned Facebook ads, and how many people here have run Facebook ads? Okay, nearly everybody. So as you're running those ads, you notice what kinds of questions Facebook asks you. They, of course, want to ask you about the demographics, right? And, and so you start thinking like, okay, what's this broad audience that I can reach? What's the age range, maybe the gender, the language, um, perhaps their location? I want you to forget all about all of that. Instead of thinking of your audience in terms of like large pools of people, think of your audience as one person. If you could find the one person who is most eager about your music and you think about the things that excite them, that's when you're thinking of enough of an audience. Because that one person, what well, chances are, if only 1% of the planet is like them, or even one-tenth of 1%, you're already surpassing that thousand true fans theory many times over. So think about that one person. What are, what are the channels that they enjoy? What are the things that they really, really like? What do they enjoy outside of music? And how can you touch upon all those things? So when we talk about finding audiences, again, it's about finding not the most people, but finding the right people. And it's all about finding this right connection. So Blake Mayakoski, before he founded Tom's Shoes, most people don't know about this, but he actually started a different company. It was called Easy Laundry. When he was in college, he found out this like dirty little secret, and that was that most college students living in dorms don't do laundry. Like they don't know how to do laundry. It's kind of gross. <laughs> but despite the fact that there are actually laundry facilities in the building, people were ignoring these things because they just didn't know how to handle it. So he thought, I'm gonna start a laundry company. 
And think about it. Like, there are already a lot of laundry companies out there. There are dry cleaners. There's professional laundromats. There were laundry machines in his unit, in each of the units on the college campus. But he knew his audience. And you know what? The audience was, was not the students. It was the parents. So at freshman orientation, he said, gets up and he says, you know what? Your kids aren't doing their laundry. They don't know how to do it. But for a few bucks every single week, I'll pick it up, I'll wash it, I'll fold it and deliver it. And then you don't have to worry about your kids wearing dirty clothes. He made enough money to just essentially drop out of college, start another company, start another company, eventually got his way to Tom's. He didn't have time to go to class. He didn't have time to go to class. He was too busy making money, like six figures, like before he turned 21. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, if you, if you think about it, Tom's Shoes also comes, like it's now dominating as this global brand, but it also began as a very, very niche market. He didn't begin like, having his shoes in Nordstrom's or Saks Fifth Avenue or any other kind of store, he began with one store in Hollywood. And he was just like, okay, these people get the kind of thing I'm doing. The, this idea that you buy one pair of shoes and this will also give one pair to somebody in need. And the, the look was very unique for the time. He was like, well, this one store gets it. What happened was he kept stocking the store and it did okay, but one day someone from Vanity Fair showed up, took a picture of it, posted it as a, a pic, and then all of a sudden he had more demand for shoes than he could possibly supply. In fact, he was working with a family in Argentina to make these shoes. It's just a family, and they were like, okay, and he's just like, muchos zapatos rapido, like was what he says to this guy, and he's like, okay, so they called in all the cousins and they just start like, sewing as many shoes as possible. One store was all it took for him to basically take over this kind of market and completely change the trend in shoes. Think about this, Starbucks, what made them special? There were a lot of coffee shops. People could buy coffee at their gas station. People get coffee in their own homes. What made Starbucks special? Well, they decided that instead of just trying to play to this market of people who need caffeine immediately when they wake up, because that's a whole lot of people, they wanted to focus on people who wanted quality. And they decided to serve this audience, an audience that was seeking something different. A third place is what they called it. The place that's in between work and home. They didn't focus, like yes, they made coffee. That wasn't their product. Their product was an atmosphere. It was an environment, a place where people could meet. It basically replicated Howard Schultz's experiences when he was traveling in Italy, where people would just hang out at a coffee shop, something that didn't really happen that much prior to the Starbucks era. And of course, they became the largest coffee company in the world as a result. But it all began with just focusing on this strange need that the, the product was just a byproduct of it. Coffee was just there, but the need was much, much different. I'll give you a personal example as well. A number of years ago, my band was performing at a bunch of anime conventions. In fact, we kind of launched our career playing at anime conventions. And so much so, where, where NPR's first story on us, on All Things Considered, this is in 2008, said that our band, The Slants, was touring around the country while building a geek army. I and mean, they called it a geek army because we were playing anime conventions. We were already getting some momentum and, and a bit of interest from press. And so as we were kind of working on filming another music video, I thought, why not film at one of these conventions? And I came up with this storyline where it was basically a music video in a music video, like where people were in a karaoke bar and we were actually the karaoke video. And in that video, we were getting beat up by a bunch of cosplayers, you know, kids dressed up like their favorite video games and anime characters, and while everyone else is just in the bar singing. And that, that was the video with the bouncing ball and lyrics. It was kind of a fun, novel thing, and I sent it to my publicist, and he said, oh, this is great. Uh, I think Alternative Press is interested in picking it up. I'm like, you don't get it. This video isn't for them. It's not for Alternative Press or Rolling Stone or anyone like that. This video was made as a loving homage to the audience that supports us. I want to debut this on a cosplay website. My publicist is like, are you crazy? Like, why would you do this? 
Like, that's a waste. And I'm like, no, no, no. Let's, look, you can have any other video, but this video that involves that community, it really should be debuted in a place where that community goes to. And they go to cosplay websites. They don't go to, like, Pitchfork or Spin. So we made this bet, if it did all right, he could have the very next video. We launch it on a cosplay website, and within a week, we had hundreds of thousands of views. The video went viral. I mean, back then, it was like a really big deal. Now it's like nothing. <laughs> but like, it caught the attention of Ryan Seacrest and Rolling Stone and Pitchfork, who were all ar arguing over the rights for our next video just because they saw how much momentum, how much traction was growing from this obscure video in the middle of nowhere, like an anime convention in Everett, Washington. But that audience found us. They loved it, and they spread it. And on top of like getting, um, you know, our, we actually ended up making a deal with Conan O'Brien, and that was our next appearance. But like on top of that, I just got start, started getting booked at conventions all over the world. And you know, the thing is, like when I started the band, I made. I, that's what I saw. I was like, there's a great market here. I want to book it. And everyone thought I was crazy. But I was like, I, just, let's just try it. We played one anime convention and made 10 grand in merch the first in three days. It was enough to pay for our, our, our van, our trailer, uh, first studio album. And then I just built, for many, many years, careers, our, our whole career around playing anime conventions. We got flown to four different continents, played them all over. In fact, we have played more anime conventions than any other music act in the world. And the funny thing is, we don't have a single song in any anime. Like, we have nothing to do with anime. We just became the band that was associated with those conventions. So now conventions are like, oh yeah, of course, we know the slants. We want to bring you in because of that. You're a part of the community. And I was able to build a, a sustainable career and have six full-time musicians with me just from this one thing. Yes, we would play club shows while we were trying to build up the rest of our career. I was, I was playing those dive bars for like 30 to 50 people a night, getting paid like maybe a couple hundred bucks, and then going to like four-star hotels on the weekend where like we had all of our needs taken care of and playing for crowds of like 15 to 20,000. So like you can find that right audience, and if you take care of them, if you're relevant, they will take care of you. Remember, marketing doesn't solve your problems. I can't like, emphasize this enough. So many artists think, like, if I'm just on that TV show, if, I'm, if I just get more in my ad in front of more people, it'll launch my career. But that's not true. Because just because every single person hears of you doesn't mean they'll care. You want to find the right people, not just anybody. Because if anybody could fill that spot on their playlist, then anybody will. You want someone who's looking for you and what you do very, very specifically. And so when we talk about like how you can find your niche, and, or it's really about finding your people. And so finding your people looks like this. You want to chase after the things that really you, there's the most energy. Like the things that you personally get excited about, that's, that's the kind of stuff that makes sense. The kind of stuff that you're, you have a lot of passion for. And of course, things that resonate with your own personal values. Things that you truly want to advocate for. Because if, if you're just doing it to just, if you're targeting like the soap makers convention because you're like, oh, that's a very niche area, I'm just going to go for it, people will see through that. You don't want to be placating an audience, you want to be a part of that audience. They want to be like connected with you in a very, very genuine fashion. And of course, you want to go for an area that has a lot of momentum. Things where you're already getting some traction. So when we talk about this idea of like who are your fans, like when you start thinking about this, like imagine this, you're setting up your next Facebook ad, you're setting up your next gig, you're, you're trying to create your next press release. Who are your fans? Like think about this very deeply because you really shouldn't be thinking about demographics so much. Like it's not about those broad categories of like age and gender and location. Like those things matter, but not nearly as much as psychographics. Psychographics are the things that drive people. They're the things that people are really passionate about. So things like values, things like their hobbies that they, they absolutely love, because that's the stuff that people actually will act on. If you think your audience is, let's say, 13 year old to 30-year-old girls, 
how much in common does a 30-year-old woman really have with a 13-year-old? I mean, really. Probably, they're probably not into the same stuff. They probably don't even interact with technology in the same kind of way. So don't think of these really, really broad categories. But if you think my audience, is, they're the kind of people who are really, really excited about, like, you know, whatever thing, Celtic music, like people who love Celtic music with like a, uh, a rock twist. That's a niche audience. And that's where like that passion will overcome any other demographic barrier. So focus on psychographics. And again, think micro, not macro. The thing is, people think of social media as this mass market system, but it's really not. Social media is not about mass market. Yes, there are massive markets on there, but social media is really about micro markets because all of a sudden you can like, curate your own feed so that you only hear about and you only see stuff that looks just like the stuff you want to hear and see. It's not, if it was mass market, then it would, you would just get anything and everything on there. But people are selective. They, they choose who to friend. And they absolutely choose who to follow. So it's, it's not a mass market system. So if you treat it like one, if you treat an audience like a, any generic person, like, hey, if you see this ad for my show coming into town, if you, like as if it were a, a poster being hung up on a telephone pole, how, how many people actually go to a show because of that? Unless, unless they know you. If, it's, if you walk down 6th Street and you saw all these flyers for all these artists that you never heard of, what's the likelihood of you going out to a, one of their gigs and shelling out 10 to 15 bucks and watching the band. Probably not very likely, not unless something about it really strikes you. So why do we treat our social media that way with these broad generic messages or these updates that have no relevance to the people following us? Think micro. So I'll give you another, another example of how I kind of utilize the same tactic. So my band is actually really, really passionate about a several th different things, but the thing that we're probably known for really, is being really passionate about food. Like, seriously, like the, a couple years ago, we had a chance to des decide if we wanted to play Chicago or Kansas City, and while we had more fans in Chicago because we played this huge anime convention there, we actually chose Kansas City because they had a restaurant that was on Anthony Bourdain's 13 places to eat before you die list. <laughs> like, that was where our priorities were. Our fans knew this because we actually filmed ourselves going to these restaurants and talking about them all the time. And, and I knew like, that kind of content would do pretty well. So instead of just blasting it on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or uh, Instagram was around by, back then, we decided to go towards the micro, the social media site that uh, focused uh, exclusively on foodies, on Yelp. So I created an account and I started reviewing, reviewing restaurants where I went. Everywhere on tour, I would just leave a review and said, you know what, if you like this review, check out my profile. I have a link and you can download my band's music for free. This led to about 20,000 downloads. So I thought, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so the next year, I decided to do it again. But this time, I noticed something. You see, in Portland, Oregon, uh, where we were living at the time, they would put out these releases like the best restaurants list. And I always got frustrated because they talked about the best Asian restaurants, but it was never any of the restaurants that I liked. Like they only talked about things that were downtown, very, very centered around one particular community. They didn't list a single Asian restaurant owned by an Asian family. And I thought that was wrong. So we put out our own release, the, the PDX Guide to Asian Eating. I linked to it in my, um, in my profile, and you know what? That led to 45,000 downloads. It's just like download this free thing. And on top of that, I started getting free food whenever I went to these Asian restaurants. <laughs> so it was awesome. I also wanted to tie it in with the like, kind of offline stuff as well. So what I did was I went to Vistaprint. I paid 35 bucks and I got 10 window clings saying it was the best of the best list of the slants and they gave them to the restaurant. So all these restaurants had our name right on the front door where they could download this food guide and of course lead to our music as well. And it didn't just stop there because a couple years later when we decided to tour Asia, we're like, you know what? Portland might be a foodie city, but Taiwan, I mean, yo, that's, that's a foodie country. 
So we want to do a, a, like a film around this. And so we decided to crowdfund it. And Taiwan also has some interesting um, dishes that maybe Western audiences might not feel so great about, like uh, this coagulated pork blood on a stick that's rolled in peanuts and um, cilantro. It's actually delicious, by the way, but like, <laughs> this kind of thing. Or like grilled duck tongues, like just the tongue of the, the duck, or um, this dish that I can't stand called stinky tofu. Like, it's in the name. It's not good. And of course, their infamous bull penis soup. So we allowed our fans who knew that we loved eating food and we liked to try new things, we said, you know what? You could be a food producer on this documentary and make sure that we eat these things if you kick in some dollars. It was more than enough money to pay for our band's tour across Asia, and we created a film, and it was actually just released on Amazon Prime this, this last week. So like, it all gets funneled back in. And of course, it was because our, our fellow foodies wanted to see us trying this food. And yeah, like, there's music in there. Like, we film our shows. But like, the way we even describe our DVD, I say it's like no reservations, but with a better soundtrack. Like, watch us eat food on our way to this big festival that we're playing. And fans loved it because we were thinking just like them. We weren't thinking about us. Like, yeah, music was just the byproduct, much in the same way that coffee is the byproduct of Starbucks. Or like the shoes, like Tom's Shoes doesn't sell shoes. They sell goodwill, the good feeling you get from helping someone else in need. You get a pair of shoes, they get a pair of shoes. Like, you could buy any pair of shoes out there. There are like an endless number of shoes, but people choose their shoes to make a statement about who they are, so that when people see those shoes on your feet, they can say, oh, you like to help people in need. You care about the planet. So it, the, the music was just the byproduct of that particular relationship. And again, smaller focus. Like I talked about how I rocked anime conventions for, for many, many years. Well, our band is actually not known as the anime convention band anymore. We're not even known specifically for our music, even though we have seven albums out. Our band is mostly known for something else, and that is going to the United States Supreme Court. You see, we got into a, a battle with the government over the rights to use our name, a battle that took seven and a half years, and yes, did take us to the United States Supreme Court. And as a result of us winning this landmark case, by the way, this case was fighting against a law that was used primarily against members of the LGBTQ community and people of color, primarily artists, nonprofits and small businesses. We took that law down, canceled it, declared it unconstitutional, and won. Yeah. So. Right. And so guess what? What kind of conventions do I play now? <laughs> yes, I know a lot of lawyers. In fact, we do uh, about 100 to 150 dates a year um, across 13 countries playing for lawyers. Like, that, that's how I roll now. Like, we, we, we do a couple anime conventions, like maybe five or six a year. But the reality is I go to law schools. I go to law conventions. Um, I, I play in the offices of law firms. And we do it for, like, a really, really good pay. They pay a lot better than those anime kids, I could tell you that. And... It's a great relationship because I didn't just like show up and just grab my guitar and started playing some songs for them. I knew the law inside and out, so I thought I have a story to tell. So when we go to these law events, like yeah, we, me and my guitarist, will play music, but I also go, get up there and do legal training for an hour. I train judges and lawyers on the law, and I talk to them about creating systemic changes to the law and how they could be better served. Uh, thinking about things from an equitable point of view. Like, there's all this kind of stuff. I, I made it as part of the package that I offer for my art. And I even released a book about it, a memoir, about our journey to the Supreme Court, starting the ban and that sort of thing. And it's opened up so many doors. So it, it didn't just happen like once or twice for me. It happened all the time, just thinking like, who are those niche audiences? Because the reality is a lot of people would be kind of bored hearing about the nuances of Section 2A of the Lanham Act from 1939, but I could tell you about every one of those little bullet points that came from that and all the Supreme Court cases related because my audience cares about that. 
And so, you know, here's another way to think about it. What's something that you really love that maybe will turn off five people that you know of? People who will question your sanity, people who question your taste. Like, what's something that people kind of find questionable? That's the kind of stuff that you should be focusing on when it comes to these micro, these niche kind of markets. And of course, when we talk about these kind of smaller markets, you always want to be giving value to your audience. You don't want to just be taking from them. You, we don't create these communities because you want them to support your career. You, we create communities because we want to support one another. So give the kind of stuff that people care about. Do the kinds of things they care about. And I would say like, yes, creating music, great music, is a gift to the world. It's a gift to these communities. But find ways to connect with them based on their values and their passions. So there's a couple of examples of companies that have really done this, like Slack. They went from 16,000 users to over 2.7 million users in two years. I mean, that is phenomenal. And they did it by keeping their product free. All along, you know, when they hit 16,000, when they hit 50,000, when they hit a million, all these venture capitalists were coming in and say, like, let us in invest money into you. You should start charging for this product. You have more than enough customers. But they said, no, that's not what our users want. They wanted to just keep on growing and growing and delivering value to those audiences by giving, some, giving them something they were passionate about. And the product was perfect because the product doesn't really work unless your friends are on Slack, unless your coworkers are on Slack. So it just grew very, very organically and naturally. And of course, after that two year period, they cashed in, they did all right. Dropbox, very similar story. You know, back in the day when you signed up for Dropbox, it would say, you know what, you can get an extra uh, 50 megabytes of space if you invite one of your friends. And if they join, both of you get 50 megabytes. Uh, all the, sorry, 500 megabytes, all the way up to 16 gigs. So really, if you were to totally utilize this system, you just got 32 extra customers for Dropbox. But you cared about it because it was a safe, secure place to store your stuff. And Dropbox knew that. In other words, they, weren't, they didn't spend all this money on marketing. They spent all their time, money, and energy on serving their community. The people did the marketing for them. So when you think about like, your niche audiences, you should be thinking, of course, who? Who is that person? But also what they're interested in and why. There, for many, many years, there was this popular concept in the world of sales that when people come to your hardware store and they buy a drill bit, they're not buying a drill bit. They're buying the, a tool to get a hole in their wall. They're essentially buying an eighth inch hole is what they're buying. But if you were to really extract this a lot more, they're not buying a hole. They're buying a place that can hold a screw that's strong enough to hold a shelf. They're, and they're not buying that shelf, they're buying the space off the floor to get all their junk off the ground, to put it on that shelf. And they're not buying that space, they're probably buying it because they're tired of getting nagged at by their partner or roommate, like you got too much stuff on the floor. They're buying convenience. So start thinking about your music and what you have to offer in these kinds of terms. Are people buying a song? Or are they buying a connection with a message they really care about? Are they, are, are they buying something fun to drive to? What, what are they buying? Start thinking about it in those kinds of terms and how you could frame up your, your music, your services, or whatever, whatever you have to offer based on this who, what, and why question. And I can't emphasize this enough, but you should flip that megaphone on social media. You see, we th get on social media thinking that it's all about us, that it's all about this megaphone, that we're, we're broadcasting all the time. But I always encourage people, don't treat social media like a megaphone. Treat it like a telephone, an exchange. Who are you gonna talk to? You're not there to talk from one to many. You're there to talk like it was one-on-one -on -one with each of these fans, the fans that are in your audience. That's what social media ought to be. And of course, if you imagine if you walked into a conversation, you met somebody and all they did was talk about themselves the whole time, what would you do? Like if they were like, hey, come to my show, hey, check out my music, hey, look at this thing I like. 
of course you'd be like, when's the, where's there the chance for me to engage? How come, I can't, how come it's all about you? Yet we treat our Instagram, Twitter, and our Facebook pages just like that, as if it was one giant me megaphone. Start thinking about it like in terms of this engagement tool to actually connect with your audience. And I, I would really encourage you as you start thinking about social media and start, how, start applying these concepts to, to your music and to your career, think of the, these three words, gym, plants, and rain. You see, I like to treat my music career and my goals like I would the gym, because no amount of working out in a single day will get you a six pack. At best, you get that one pack thing going on, right? Like, you, the only way to get fit is to show up consistently, to be persistent about it, to sweat. Same thing with plants. If you put six months or a year's worth of water on your house plants, guess what's gonna happen? <laughs> the only way to do it is by watering it a little bit each day. How much? Enough. Find that smallest viable audience and water it each day. And from that, you can actually see results. You can see it grow. And finally, rain. I was thinking about this the other day because um, sometimes, like when I come up with uh, podcast ideas, I, I do a lot of that while, while driving or traveling. And I remember just about two weeks ago, I was driving and Nashville had one of its many like sudden thunderstorms where it was like a flash flood within a few seconds and it was just pouring. And I, I, as I started thinking about the rain, I started thinking about the phrase, make it rain. Like people say that all the time, make it rain, we're gonna make it rain. I'm like, well, you know what's interesting about rain is that it's not one drop. It's not one thing. Rain is comprised of billions and billions of tiny little drops. If you wanna make it rain, you have to make concentrated effort in many, many different ways. Concentrating it in one area. Because if you had like a billion drops of water falling, but they were falling in all over the planet, people wouldn't even notice. It would just be considered vapor. But if you put it in like a square foot area, you better believe people will notice. So focus in on that key audience and watch those results instead of trying to spread out those efforts all over the country, all over the world, all over the internet. Focus on that, that niche audience and show up consistently and, and be persistent about it. And if you're interested in more kind of tips about social media, tomorrow I'm gonna to be doing a session at 11 a.m. in Salon F on social media hacks that defy trends. It's kind of a follow-up for my session if you came to it last year on um, how to be a social media rock star because a lot of things have changed since then. And just as a kind of a reminder that if you're interested in winning every single one of my books plus selling all of the records you've ever produced, tweet at me, use the hashtags. So, wanted to leave some time for some questions. Yeah. You don't know where your is. You, have, you actually do something that, that drives you. You play a kind of music, maybe it's your own drummer. You don't know where your people are. How do you find your people? How do you find your people? Well, I would say go back to those ideas, like the things you're most passionate about, the things you're most energetic about. Like, what's the stuff that you want to write about, that you wish you could write about? Or like if you are currently writing about something, like how can you dissect it in a way that is relevant to one person or just a few, just a few people? Like again, it's just finding a way to narrow down things. Like uh, for example, instead of just saying like I, I play rock, like my, my band plays synth pop music, I thought what's a way that we could distinguish ourselves? So I, because we are an all Asian American dance rock band, I decided to call our music Chinatown Dance Rock. I focused on, on media that was entirely related to Asian Americans. And I built up enough of a following there to create some momentum and of course did the same thing again and again with anime conventions, with foodies and with lawyers. Those are all like separate categories um, and all parts of communities that I find myself in. But like I just started thinking like what's something that like sets us apart? So another way to think about it is like if someone asks you to describe yourself, like what your, your pitch is, your pitch should be able to be something that contained in this idea of like if you could answer it um, like we are the first or we are the only, like if you could say one of those phrases, you already found yourself in a little bit of a niche. 
So, um, you know, like for me, it was like we were the first and we're, we are the first and only all Asian American dance rock band in the world. That immediately set us up differently. Uh, another way to think about it is like, is there a convention for it? If you're not sure, just Google it, search for it. Chances are there probably is like a, a, a very specific convention, festival, or gathering. Um, you can go on meetup.com, look at like how people group themselves together. That's another way to think about like how people see themselves. Like they basically label themselves in that particular community. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, right on. <laughs> and um, it's been going pretty well so far. Uh, and I'm wondering, at what point do you kind of reach the maximum, you know, what you can get from that niche? And how do you know if, if you've reached that point? And then what do you do? And what would you do uh, after that, after you've kind of like sucked out all the things from your niche and grown your community? Yeah, so if you start seeing results kind of plateauing, uh, and, you're, and you're thinking like, okay, I've gotten everything that I can out of it. So like with uh, Wizard Rock, like in particular, you think I've already played um, a leaky con, I've already played all these Harry Potter conventions, already, I'm playing libraries and, and, and other kinds of gatherings, what else can we do? Well, uh, you can either think about other things you're passionate about or kind of these corollary audiences. So for example, um, if you're in Wizard Rock and, and there's a couple of bands out there in the world that, that are, like, you can easily play other types of fan conventions and events because there are people, like the people that are really passionate about like Harry Potter and, and, and the kind of wizardry probably are passionate about other things as well. So there's, it depends if on, on like your individual passions and interests, but let's say you're interested into metaphysical stuff, like it's a natural fit, then you can kind of start building off of that particular community. Um, or, or you know those other kind of fan conventions. So th there's certainly ways to like do that. Or if you feel like you're getting all the support that you can possibly get from this audience, then you might consider broadening up that scope a little bit. So just like uh, we were able to kind of move from the world of anime conventions into the world of like law conventions, and and kind of create the sustainable career for ourselves, we we didn't necessarily. Um, like abandon that audience, we just pivoted to a new one that where we saw the momentum, where we saw things happening because there was, seemed to be a lot of interest. And if you're not quite sure of that, you can always ask your audience. Like you can do a survey, uh, you know, treat it like a focus group. I don't, I don't know why mo more musicians aren't doing this, but you can certainly ask people what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, uh, what things they read, what so sites they use and so on, and use that information to help inform you of your next uh, career steps. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any uh, advice or experience dealing with imposter syndrome within a niche, uh, because uh, I've been involved in niche communities before, um, and one thing that I always struggled with was that these people are all much more experienced and have much more expertise on this specific subject. So it's like, what am I actually doing here? And I was wondering if there's a way or like any advice that you have with dealing with that kind of feeling, that mentality. A absolutely. Um, there's a, a lot that I would love to say about like feeling imposter syndrome. In fact, I just did an episode on it like where I kind of broke down a ton of resources on it. If you go to musicbusinesshacks.com and just scroll down a little bit, there is a, a bunch of resources there. So I would say like for the in-depth answer, like you can go ahead and listen to that episode and there's links to books and things that I recommend. Um, but in terms of dealing with imposter syndrome, it's like a much bigger thing that I think is beyond just kind of niche audiences. And that, that has to do with like confidence, it has to do with wellness. It, there's a lot of facets to this thing. Um, I would say there's a couple of things that I do recommend. Like if it's an audience that you feel like you're genuinely a part of, like demonstrate that. If it's one that you are kind of like moving into, like for example, I was moving into the world of law and I was like, are you kidding me? I gotta like teach this district judge how to do law, like I didn't go to law school. Um, I thought, 
okay, what is it that I have to offer? What do, I, what do I have a value that I can give them? And really, really leaned in on that while I was still growing. And at the same time, being completely transparent about it. Like, you probably know the law better than I do, at least in this area, but let me tell you my story. Um, or I would ask a lot of questions before just assuming that people would think like I'm a fake. Um, and it worked out really well for me. So uh, th there's a whole bunch of other like tactics that, but I would definitely recommend like checking out that resource. There's a lot of great books and like free stuff out there for it too. Yeah. Oh. Um, so thinking about expanding your market, you love food. I love coffee. <laughs> um, so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, like in addition to talking about my music, I can absolutely talk about all of the really geeky coffee shops that I'm going to. And then I'm thinking about, okay, when I'm putting that on Instagram, I'm obviously using the coffee hashtags. When you're doing food, when you're hashtagging it or when you're tagging it wherever you are, are you tagging just food-related tags or are you including your music-related tags as well? So I haven't really been tagging food-related things. I just focus on the channel. Uh, and you know, I, I haven't been doing as much on that kind of foodie audience thing, at least for, for my band. I do it just because I, I love food and I only want to know what what to eat. Um, but there's a couple different things you can do. Uh, tomorrow I'll talk more about like hashtagging um, strategy, but, but like one quick tip on doing this is like, when you think about hashtagging, thinking about it in sets of three. So you wanna aim for about nine to 12 hashtags. Three of your hashtags are wh what we're gonna call the mega hashtags. These are hashtags that have over five million posts on them. So those are the like very, very broad people are like, everybody's tagging it. Then you're, you, got, you want to do another hashtags, about three or four hashtags in what we call the medium category. So that's uh, between 500,000 and about 2 million uh, posts. And obviously as you're posting on Instagram, I'm assuming you're using Instagram, you could see the number right there. But you can also Google this. Um, and then you want three, hashtags to five hashtags on what I call the very niche or small. And so that's like less than 50,000 posts on there. What ends up happening is if you do really, really well with the, the niche category, like clever hashtags or the things that people aren't using quite as much, it, Instagram and its formula will float you up into the medium category a bit more where a lot more people are searching. And if you do well there, they'll get you up to that, that the higher echelon. So thinking about like hashtags, not only in terms of like the audience and like the, the things that they want to use, but also how you can like get into the audience effectively is, is really important as part of that kind of mindset. On top of that, if you're, if you're really into coffee culture and you got songs about coffee and, you, and you're, like, you're in that coffee world, then I would say like, definitely focus. There's like entire magazines and websites just dedicated to coffee. Um, and perhaps consider that as a way to pivot and say, like, how, okay, how can I develop relationships with these coffee shops? Maybe I'll make a list. Maybe they'll include me in return on their playlist when they're pl in their coffee shop. Maybe I could partner up with a roaster to create my own unique like coffee blend based on all these things because I write about coffee all the time. I'm always constantly tasting people who follow me for my coffee like expertise. You have something of value to offer in that world, give it. And you know, I've, I've done the same thing, like I've gotten I, like we have, for, for a couple of years, our band had our own custom-made smartphones. I had my, my own signature line of guitars with Fender. I, like all these things just from like, what can I do to give value to them and, and, and create a partnership around that? So there, there's other ways to think about it as well, not just like in terms of accumulating fans. Uh, so I would say like think micro market, but, th but think bigger in terms of that micro market. I, I, so you had your hand up for a little bit, so uh, right here. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Ellen Allard. I'm wondering if it's possible to niche down too much. Mm -hmm. My niche used to be early childhood music, mm -hmm. and I did that for a really long time. And then I niched down quite a bit further to Jewish early childhood music. And I'm wondering if that, if it's possible to actually niche down too far. Uh, it depends, and so that's what we call smile, the, that, that phrase, smallest viable audience. That audience has to be viable. It has to be enough to be able to serve you. But as we mentioned, like if you find a thousand people, that can be enough. So if you're worried that it's like, like too laser focused, then don't be afraid to broaden up a bit. But I would say like, 
given the population of this planet, it's very, very hard to be too narrow in its focus. In fact, one of my friends is a, is a Jewish pop star and he plays youth camps. Like while he's playing in his indie alt rock band, that's what he does like in his nights and weekends. So like, I'm like, he's make, making it work. <laughs> And, and he actually wears, like many musicians, multiple hats. So maybe you can lean into a couple different areas as well. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, Simon. Um, mine is kind of a technical question. When you're a musician and your media is starting to go up, but you want to switch to keynote, how do you make that transition? Are you still a musician and a keynote speaker at the same time, or you just let the music go and go to keynote? That's a great question. So I actually do both these days. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm very, very passionate about the music that I create, um, but I realize that it's not paying the bills as much as like me speaking at these law events. So what I do is I offer me speaking at a discount if they book my band and fly out my guitarist. And of course, all these lawyers are like, yes, we want to be able to say the band played here too. And I basically sell them on this idea like, no, your law convention will be a lot cooler if you have a band than if you don't. <laughs> and, and they all do it. And, and again, it, it gives us a, a living wage. I'm able to pro provide for my guitarist and, and my, my, my singer who just had a baby. So we've been able to like, bring that in. And, I, and the way I do it is just like, like, this is a part of my whole self. This is a part of my story. It's a part of my art. And so, uh, yeah, I travel as a speaker. I write and, and I play music. And I, I just figure if I could find opportunities where I can blend all those things, awesome. And if I can't, at least I can still do one of those things and still be able to like practice those other things and serve audiences in a different kind of way. So if you're interested in being a speaker, by the way, um, there's this podcast called Side Hustle School. Uh, Chris Gilbo does it. There, I, I did an episode with, with him and talked about how I was able to like, um, earn over 30 grand a year just speaking while I was in my undergrad program just by pitching myself as a speaker. I, I also have the, the world record for most number of TED Talks, so like, there, which I'll talk about tomorrow because that's another niche audience. <laughs> uh, but, Thank you so much for being here. If, if you're interested and you have more questions, I have a speaker's table out there. I also have a, a couple of books uh, that are available, like these ones right here. So if you're interested in learning how to get sponsors and endorsements, um, if you want to learn about daily practices or you're interested in that memoir, I'll be right at that speaker's table. Thank you again. Yeah.